Good evening. How are we doing tonight? How are the students in the back? Students in the back are good? A lot of empty seats up front, guys, come on. They're scared of me, they're, up, they're in the back. Uh, good evening, I'm Carl Aspelund. I'm the Associate Director of the Honors Program. Welcome to tonight's session of the 60th Honors Colloquium, entitled Not Business as Usual or Business as the Common, for the Common Good. Now, we're delighted to have you here on this beautiful evening, uh, but before we get into the show, a few housekeeping details I'd like to share with you. First of all, the exits, should you need them, are in the back and on either side of the stage. Uh, the restrooms are in the foyer. And uh, we ask that you please not take photos or uh, video uh, during this evening's event. Now, before we go any further, as is our custom and privilege, I will deliver our land acknowledgement statement. The University of Rhode Island occupies the traditional stomping ground of the Narragansett Nation and the Niantic people. We honor and respect the enduring and continuing relationship between the indigenous people and this land by teaching and learning more about their history and present day communities and by becoming stewards of the land that we too inhabit. And this evening, we are fortunate and honored to have with us members of the Narragansett tribe, Samantha Cullen Fry, accompanied by Amelia and Olivia, to formally acknowledge the land on which URI is situated. Welcome to the homeland of the Narragansett people. Asqui Kasa Natasuis Amelia, Kanufiyam Katabatash. Thank you, Amelia. No, I gotta go back up. I'm a little bit taller than her. Oscar Wikwas and Winnie Naka and Kanupi, I'm welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone, for joining us today. Um, it's a quick two minutes, so we can't cover all that business and companies and, and all of that, but we have a little bit. We try to carve out a little bit for you all. So uh, in America, business is capitalism, right? And capitalism is kind of contrary to being an indigenous person whose homelands that we are on. And so I think it's really important to always consider that when we are talking about business, when we are talking about the development of business, whether that's from a hiring standpoint, developing business, if we're talking about marketing businesses, and what does that really mean? And really putting people over profits, right? And that's something that doesn't really jive well with a capitalistic society, but it's inherent to who we are. In the Narragansett language, there's no word for ownership. It is not a concept or an idealism that we have, and it's something that we struggle with to this day in this economy and trying to figure out survival um, as we go along. And so there are different ways that we do that. I have beautiful handmade earrings on by beaters who use their traditional knowledge to try to create systems of diverse economies Economies, right? So we've got stonemasons and beaters, and I have a beautiful bag by my cousin, which is Kate Spade, but now it's by Silver Moon LaRose. Um, so there's all these different ways that folks are intersecting with business, but I think it's important to understand that that can come in many different ways, places, and spaces, and that knowledge comes from different many ways of places and spaces. Um, and so I think we need to think about the traumas that come into that, the systemic oppressions that are built into business, that are in the system that we kind of gloss over on our day-to-day, -day, but we have to take note of as we go along. And I think for us, as indigenous people, it's putting the people, the land, and all of our relations first at every interim um, as we start to think about all of that development and all that that pertains. So I want to say katabatash to my daughters for joining me tonight, Amelia and Olivia, and katabatash for you all for having this greater conversation around business and it being not business as usual. Katabatash. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Olivia. Now, this colloquium celebrates the 100th anniversary of the College of Business and the 60th anniversary of the colloquium itself. It represents and celebrates what the Honors Colloquium does best, delving into the major issues of our time. It also embodies the new direction that we are heading in in Honors Education at URI, 
namely, to prepare our URI students to become change agents, forces for the common good. In this daunting world with unprecedented challenges ahead, they need all the support they can get, and we aim to begin providing that to them here and now. Now, producing a series of this scope requires one or two years of planning and many, many campus partners. I would like to take a moment to thank especially the colloquium coordinators, Christy Ashley, Doug Creed, and Sarai Ergene from the College of Business. Let's have a little hand for them. I would like to acknowledge all the sponsors you can see listed on our program, and a special thanks to the President's and the Provost's office, and I'm delighted that Barbara Wolf, our Provost, is here with us tonight. Now, um, I would be remiss if I did not uh, pull out the fundraising uh, moment here, but I would like to tell you that the day of giving here on campus was a couple of weeks ago, and that, if you aren't familiar with that, is the university's day of giving back. And uh, we had a very generous double the impact challenge for our honors program. And uh, Provost Barbara Wolf was instrumental there in bringing us to meet a generous $5,000 challenge in giving. And we received over $13,000 in gifts. So, So yes, a good hand for Provost Wolf and all our donors. Now please use the QR code here if you like to, or go to alumniuri.edu. Every gift counts uh, to help us moving and help us working on projects like this. Your gifts will fund things like student projects, travel and social events, experiential learning experiences, for example, going out on Narragansett Bay to work on big data fish counting projects, we need IT upgrades in our classrooms in Lippitt Hall so we can keep providing students with cutting edge learning technology. And our faculty training and best practices in honors education is necessary to keep our students learning from the best highly trained instructors at this university. Now, finally, I would like to draw your attention to a new project of commissioned art pieces that will portray the diversity of honors students over the years. We will unveil our first four portraits of honor students by a URI alum and renowned artist, Aganza. And this will be done tomorrow at an art opening in Lippitt Hall on October 18th, tomorrow, at 4.30 p.m. And I hope you will join us there. And one more thing, actually. We would like to thank the co-sponsors of tonight's event, the Eleanor M. and Oscar M. Carlson Women's Studies Lecture Endowment. The endowment was established in 1994 and was financed and financially anchored the women's studies program that was formally established in 1980. The endowment funds a full student scholarship for a single parent and also other student scholarships as well. It funds innovations in curricular and scholarly developments in the field and it funds the Carlson lecture series so be on the lookout for that. Now in closing, I would like to acknowledge Rosaria Pisa, the chair of the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. I'm sure she's out here somewhere. Thank you for being here and for your support. And now, to introduce our speakers, Helena Ajakaye and Lauren Gray, please welcome our moderator for this evening's event, the director of URI's Women's Center, Anna Barasa. Our introductions fell, so just give me a moment. I have to pull them up digitally if you don't. Thank you, Carl. We're, we're missing a script that was meant to be on the podium. And thank you to the Honors Colloquium for inviting me to facilitate this conversation this evening. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Helena Ajakaya. 
Alina D. Ajakaya is the Executive Vice President at Meet Boston, bringing nearly 20 years of sales, marketing, operations expertise to her role at the organization. Helena has specific oversight over several departments, including human resources, partnership development, finance, leisure destination services, and operations. And she leads many of the Meet Boston most important initiatives related to community engagement, workforce development, accessibility, and a wide range of mission-critical work in equity, diversity, and inclusion space. A native of Ethiopia, Ajakaya immigrated to the United States in 1987, perfected English as a second language, and simultaneously graduated with her high school diploma and an associate's degree at the age of 17. She went on to pursue her undergraduate studies at the University of Massachusetts and later earned her MBA in International Marketing Management from Northeastern University in 2017. Previously, she worked for Ald Delays, where she received national recognition for her success in leading multiple teams and overseeing an operating budget of $805 million in annual revenue. Ajakaya is passionate about causes that advance equity. At the Meet Boston, she spearheads a partnership with Tourism Diversity Matters that aims to diversify the travel and hospitality workforce, particularly in upper management and leadership tiers. The Meet Boston TDM model that Ajakaya has advanced is now recognized and endorsed by the U.S. Travel Association as the leading model for other destination marketing organizations to emulate. She also currently serves as co-chair of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee for Destination International. Ajakaya has also developed a 501c3 private foundation that will allow the organization to pursue charitable work and community partnership like never before. Ajakaya is the founder of the RISE Women's Leadership Conference, for which she was named Rhode Islander of the Year in 2019 by Rhode Island Monthly. She has been called on to serve on the network of executive women as board director for Big Brothers Big Sisters and Progreso Latino, and as a board trustee for the Woodward School for Girls. She has recently joined the board of Rose F. Kennedy Greenway Conservancy, where her voice will amplify and guide the Greenway's core mission to create a sustainable urban green space that is active, immersive, and above all else, accessible. Ajakaya is an inductee into the Big Brothers Big Sisters People We Admire program and is a graduate of the Partnership Incorporated's Leadership Program. Along with her husband and two children, she is an avid traveler who embraces the notion that travel breaks down barriers, allows for cultures and contact to flourish, and cultivates global citizens. Please welcome Helena D. Ajakaya. Lauren Gray brings a law degree and 15 years of experience in strategic communications, crisis management, policy, and social issues to help clients manage complex reputational issues. Lauren is also part of the Edelman Leadership for its Societal Issues Task Force and its LGBTQ Plus Task Force, counseling clients across industries such as health finance, CPG, retail, fashion, and tech. Prior to Edelman, Lauren provided crisis communications support to the City of New York and Planned Parenthood Federation of America. She trained survivors of military sexual assault to share their stories with members of Congress and the media. And she led communications for the first lawsuit filed against former President Trump's now repealed transgender military ban. In 2023, Lauren was one of four Edelman employees honored in New York City and state political PR Power 50. In 2022, PR Week named Lauren to its Pride in PR list, featuring 30 leading LGBTQ professionals. Lauren was also honored by PR Week as a champion of PR, one of 36 women in the United States who represent the gold standard in the industry. Please welcome Lauren Gray.
Thank you both for willing to give us and impart some of your wisdom and some learned um, information about this topic of this evening. I'm gonna start with Lauren and ask for you to please describe how gender for you has played a role in your career. Well, thank you so much and thank you for having me this evening. Such an important conversation on gender equality, particularly as it pertains to business. I think for myself, it would be very difficult to describe how gender has impacted my own professional experience without acknowledging um, that I am a queer woman and how being queer has also impacted it, um, recognizing that intersectionality. Um, and I think that um, it's impacted it in ways big and, and very, very small. So for example, um, when I first went to law school, I went to law school in Ohio, I anticipated staying in Ohio and potentially doing um, legal aid work there. Um, I came out during law school and it was a, a very, very difficult and, and painful experience with my family. And I ended up taking a completely different career trajectory, um, one that I very much love now and has turned into something wonderful. Um, but absolutely impacted my direction and choices. Um, on a smaller level, I think being a female professional um, really impacts so much of how we communicate every day and present ourselves. I know that we had a talk earlier about um, you know, many women professionals that I work with thinking about things as small as emails and how that communication comes across. Did I use too many exclamation points? Did I not use enough exclamation points? Will I appear to be friendly? Will I come off as too intimidating? So I think those sorts of nuanced um, conversations internally happen all the time as part of that as well. Um, and, and then another just really quick thing that I wanted to mention um, for women especially that I think is so critical um, is both finding someone to be a mentor for you but also finding someone to be um, what we would call a sponsor. So someone who um, most often is in your workplace that's able to sort of pound the table for you, is able to really say your name in rooms when you're not there. Um, it, it's something that we've talked a lot about, having someone to kind of guide you and, and help with all of those really important conversations. Um, so anyway. The same question for you, Helena. Could you describe how gender has played the role in your career? Yeah, first of all, I, I just want to say how incredible it's been. First of all, thank you so much for the generous introduction, but also for the incredible day we've had today, Lauren. Um, we've gotten to spend a day, a couple of hours with each class, and about 90 students, I think is what Doug told us. And it has been such a replenishment of my soul to think that the next generation of leaders and some in this room are going to make you know a lot of impact that's going to not only change the trajectory of where we've been and where we're going but things that we're talking about as far as women so i'll give you some i think things that have shaped me you know coming to the united states in 1987 uh, at the age of 12 without knowing the english language was a profound experience just from a assimilation of culture and language but one thing that i think has shaped me in terms of the woman I am today is that me and my sisters, I had two sisters, came here without my mother. And so my father being, I think, a single father and you know, driving cabs all day, going to law school at night, working security guard overnight, we had to raise ourselves for, for a good amount of time in, in Boston. And that had taught me at a very young age that women and girls were endangered species. I felt it in moments of my growth and you know, you know, it's a great thing that I've never really experienced adversity because I've always had women who have really mentored me and have always, you know, sought a good path for me. But when I think about, you know, as I grew through high school and really, you know, right after I finished undergrad, I started realizing the suede of giving back. What does that look like as a woman? Because a lot of girls and women don't have that opportunity. And even at 46 now as a mother of, you know, two boys who are, you know, 14 and 17, I'm so passionate about women because a lot of the 
you know, social legislation and policies and me being in the boardroom as an only woman in retail or being kind of the only executive of color in my current role, it impacts you on a daily basis. So I'm always thinking about how do you change the trajectory and how does that shape you? So I think back at, you know, when I got here and my mom told me, no matter what happens, lean on good women, support good women, and make sure that if you're in a room and you feel impacted as a woman, say something. And so I've taken that along from my mom, and uh, she's a strong woman who still lives in Ethiopia, who still keeps in touch with me. And so that mentorship, that sponsorship, that connotation of say my name when I'm not in the room is something that I live by and I do it every day and uh, as I get older. Thank you both for sharing that um, and such personal aspects of it. Um, which, and I'm glad you brought up the idea of intersectionality because I think one of, one of my key questions as I was reading through the questions is, as a woman, we have so many different roles and our intersectional identities sometimes are at play when we're in these spaces and in these boardrooms. So for you, what would you say is the business case for a more inclusive leadership team? Um, as it relates to having to navigate these identities that at times can be in conflict with some of the business, if you would. You know, I think we, we had an opportunity to talk about this throughout the day around what the ROI, KPI, the benefit of having different perspectives in the room is. And we talked about it from kind of expanding your mind, but also from a specific kind of monetary gain, right? We know that when there are diverse people in the boardroom, the PNL is healthier that there are you know, kind of wide ranges of thinking about a business case and serving really what, what we are living in right now, which is a global community. Um, so I, I think that the business case is that, you know, if you look at companies, McKinsey did a study, they just renewed it. Um, when you have a company that has a diverse group of people, whatever that diversity is, whether it's gender, whether it's you know, age, whether it's socioeconomic background, education, there's a wealth of, I think, benefit that's trackable and that's you know, kind of impactful to the bottom line. And um, if businesses are not thinking about that and they're thinking about not serving a global economy, a global population, that's really a loss in my mind. Um, one thing that you know, within my current role right now, and you mentioned earlier, um, very passionate about making sure that the boardroom is diverse. And when I'm in the boardroom, I often do find myself alone. Um, however, I know that the appetite is there, and I'm also thinking about who else should be at the table. And when we do bring people to the table that are from different perspectives, I think our results are measurable and that it's more uh, sustainable to actually have people from different backgrounds. So, you know, be mindful of, e you know, equal opportunity hiring practices, workforce development, businesses as it pertains to economy impact, supplier diversity, making sure that there's that broad stroke of the, the diversity and not just the literal um, application of it, but in the thinking and the leadership of it. Lauren, your thoughts? Yeah, so I, um, I work at Edelman, as they mentioned. Edelman is a global communications firm. Um, and a lot of what we're doing from a global communications perspective is really seeking to um, cut through the noise and have communications land. And I think that we can't possibly do that. We can't possibly be relevant in culture if we don't have people at the table who reflect our society and culture. I, I think that is an absolutely critical piece. Um, and, and we were talking earlier, um, we were actually at an event over the weekend um, with the human rights campaign and they were featuring Shonda Rhimes. And Shonda Rhimes talked about how really critically important it is to be at the table, just as Helena is saying. And she mentioned that in her career, she's incredibly committed to, if there isn't a chair at the table, building a chair for someone to be there. So, um, you know, as we're talking about sponsors and talking about mentors, um, you know, not only thinking about identifying who those individuals can be for you, but who you could be that for, for someone else. Is there a way that you can think about who's missing in that room? How can you bring them in? What does it mean to have different experiences or identities missing? And how does that make our counsel or our perspective or our ideas feel very incomplete? I, I love that concept that both of you have that touched out on, not only the mentor and support um, building the chair is a phenomenal 
even vision of thinking of that. In the work that you are currently doing or have seen in your, in your thought process, what would you say are some innovative solutions that you've seen from companies that you either work for or, or have noticed and that, that are making an impact in this gender equality and inclusivity? Yeah, so from an inclusion perspective, um, we're actually doing something really interesting at Edelman. We've put together um, an LGBTQ task force called Out Front, um, and it's actually really recently, just within the last few months, sort of gained a lot of industry attention from outlets like Adweek and others who are tracking how communications and PR businesses um, are addressing things like inclusion. Um, and through this task force, we're able to ensure that when companies raise questions, when companies say things like, um, should we be providing gender-affirming care to our employees, or what is gender-affirming care, or should we be saying something for Pride Month, or how do we effectively engage the LGBTQ community 365 days a year, that we make sure that we have sort of a very, very uh, intersectional, qualified, integrated team of professionals in that room that are qualified to have those discussions. It sounds in some ways very basic, but I can't emphasize enough how across the industry, those sorts of things are not necessarily happening other places. Um, so that has been one really important step that we've taken to try to make sure that the right folks are at the table. Alina? Yeah, and I'll kind of, I think that, you know, mentioning uh, some tactful things that have been happening within my industry, specifically with Meet Boston and, and tourism and hospitality. So when I got to the organization in 2020, it was at the heels of the pandemic. Spent a year virtually getting to know the industry, Prior to that, I was in retail, and I had really created a formula that made sense to me around food and security and serving different communities, having 451 different stores in different communities. What does that mean? What does health mean and security mean? But when I got to hospitality and tourism, I realized that we had a, a community of 23 neighborhoods. We had a membership uh, model that we now call partnership where the hospitality and tourism industry is the third largest in the city of Boston. Our revenue is about $15 billion, but really tracking where those dollars went was something that we as a team were very passionate about. So we created a task force. We actually asked 25 businesses that I had never heard of Meet Boston or the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau to be a part of a task force so that they can help us re-evaluate, re-articulate the value proposition of being part of that tourism economy. We did that over the course of two years. So the deal was, hey, Lauren, come be a member of Meet Boston. You don't have to pay the membership fee. You're going to help me assess the membership model as it is now. We're going to create a partnership model. So when you have that diversity in, I think, the portfolio where we had a 98%, you know, um, retention, less than 2% attrition, only two of the businesses over 900 were uh, of communities of color. There's 23 neighborhoods. So that's been a really successful initiative where now we have over 100 businesses that identify from different backgrounds. The most recent thing that we've launched is workforce development and supplier diversity. When you think about, once again, you know, having um, conventions and meetings coming to the city of Boston, and we're booked until 2039, who do we kind of give the RFPs to in terms of you know, transportation uh, contracts, um, security contracts? So it's that granular to make sure that the people that live in the city of Boston, 57% uh, communities of color, um, so it's a majority minority city. We in 2020 elected our first black mayor. Our current mayor is an Asian mayor. So there's a really, you know, 149 different languages are spoken in the city. And I think making sure that the economy for the visitor economy spread is spread widely, you know, widely through 23 neighborhoods. So those are kind of measurable, impactful things that you can do to make sure that things are done equitably and impactfully. That's some, that's some great work when you include these voices that have never been heard from before, or these identities, and it, talking about bringing people to the table and making sure that we build a chair. Um, on the flip side of that, can you talk a little bit about some of the biggest challenges or frustrations that you've had to overcome recently in that same work, Kalina? 
You know, I think that, you know, convincing uh, folks to, you know, this is this is not a, a new thing in any endeavor that anybody would take. I think that I'm always intrigued and, and, and when challenges come, and we talked earlier in one of the classes where one of the students asked, you know, what do you do with adversity? What do you do with, you know, constantly trying to be a change agent and there's always that naysayer? And I said, lean into it. Lean into it and, and, and you know, I've had some great ideas that, are measured, that have numbers behind them, that have pr been proven, and someone will say, absolutely not, I don't believe it, you know, I don't believe that this is the right thing to do. And the analogy I gave, and you know, I know that uh, some of the folks in this room might have heard it, is that scientists need to study, scientists need to study toxic agents, <laughs> and to do that they put on masks, because they can't inhale too much of that stuff, because it's not good for your health. It's the same thing with disagreeing and agreeing, and being in a room of, you know, kind of adversaries, but you need to stay in it, you need to sit in it, you need to understand the perspective of that individual or group of people, not to convince, but to understand. And so that's probably what I experienced the most in being an executive who is a black woman. Um, a lot of the times I do find myself by myself in a room, um, but I know that my leadership, my team, and really the foundation of why I'm doing the work I do make sense. So I lean into it. And I walked out of rooms with folks giving me a lot of you know, microaggressions or you know, subliminal covert messages. It almost inspires me that there's still more work to do. It doesn't discourage me. So I experience it all the time, every day, and I just focus on the positive. Oh, interesting, because I know that Helena mentioned some of the really powerful conversations that we had today with students and classes, and one of the questions that came up along these lines was, um, you know, we want businesses to be taking action for the common good, um, but, but what is the common good? How do we define the common good, and, and what do we do when people disagree about that? So um, Edelman actually has... Um, a study that it's done for the past two decades on trust. It's called the Edelman Trust Barometer. Um, Edelman has measured trust in four key societal institutions, business, government, media, and for NGOs. Um, and as part of those studies, we are seeing right now an environment that is just incredibly divisive and deeply polarized. Um, and some of that polarization is creating, I think, challenges with regard to how we define and understand the common good. And we were talking about some of these um, statistics, which I think are so shocking and, and heartbreaking. So. Um, you know, one of them is that, you know, only 30% of people would uh, willingly stop to help someone that has a different political viewpoint than they have. Only 20% of people would be interested in working with someone who has a different political viewpoint than they have. And only 20% of people would be willing to live in the same neighborhood with someone who has a different political viewpoint than they have. So certainly from a challenge perspective, making sure that we get rid of some of the misinformation and disinformation that can really erode trust um, and, and create this very, very deep polarization. Yeah, that, that, we were talking about this at dinner a little bit and that can be extremely challenging when we are living in this space where we, are, we feel personally assaulted by some of these things. So I, I can understand the challenge. Uh, so I'm gonna put this a little bit in a different spectrum of what do you think or how individuals can take action to support gender equality and inclusivity in their own professional and personal lives? What are some specific actions or some thoughts that you would be able to impart? So certainly at Edelman, I think some of what's most hopeful and heartening is that we are seeing people bring such innovation to this conversation. One of our clients is the United Nations Population Fund. It's the UN agency that's focused on global sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, and they launched recently an incredibly interesting campaign called Body Right. It's about sort of turning the ways that we think about digital violence on its head. So really the campaign itself is about challenging social media companies to address um, things on social media like um, you know, so-called revenge porn or upskirt photos with the same urgency that they address corporate copyright violations. So I think for a long time people would report this kind of online violence and would hear responses about sort of the inability to effectively address those things in a timely way. So by really juxtaposing those two things, corporate copyright violations and these issues, um, the campaign called Body Right, drawing on the 
concept of copyright um, has really been an integral, interesting way to try to move that conversation forward. So I am just so heartened by um, some of the innovation and, and interesting ways that we're trying to, to change the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, and we talked a lot about, I think, the power of storytelling and the power of narration and advocacy and policy making. We talked a lot about the need to bridge the um, the ways in which we advocate. I think a lot of the times, you know, folks think and we're up on stage and you're listening to us and we're shaping some narrative, right? Some narrative of what we think are solutions. And some of the questions that came up today that really intrigued me is, you know, do I have to be a politician or do I have to speak in order to make change happen? We talked about, you know, um, advocacy around, you know, the internet. Um, your social media, how, what do you consume on a daily basis? Um, I also learned that maybe some of the generations today don't consume the media, but we're constantly consuming some form of visual or sound or uh, materials that we're reading that shapes, I think, how we think about change making. So, you know, one of the things that I, you know, think about when I think about the power of narration is a campaign that we worked on around the city of Boston and, and what people think Boston is. And it was such an incredible experience sitting and listening to 300 people talk about what they thought Boston was. And it was that moment when I realized that if you're not telling the right narration and if you're letting other people tell your story, there's a subset of people that will create that narrative of, we're not welcoming. There aren't people that live there that are, whether LGBTQ+, veteran, black, um, there's not a place for you to visit. You know, while I still kind of believe and sit in that there are areas where there's still um, opportunities, like there are in other destinations, I realized at that moment that the internet was telling our stories and that folks thought all we had was donkeys and Dunkin' Donuts and Goodwill Hunting. We have all of that, but we have so much more. And so the power of storytelling from a marketing perspective and that being a change agent and having different forms of that. You don't have to be talkative to make a change. You can do it through legislation, policy making, petitions. We talked about clickism, making sure that you're entrenched in um, the room that's making the decision, even at this young age, you know that there's a business major on this side, there's an activist on the other side, there's somebody that wants to be a politician. It takes everybody to be interconnected to make change happen and really understanding what that formula is and staying in it. Thank you for that. Uh, we're getting down to our final question, and I'm going to ask each of you what are you working on now that you're most hopeful about and what will deliver the most impactful result? I'm going to say personally for you, not necessarily in a professional way, but personally for you. You had a formula, but you go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You go, you go you're good, you're good, go. <laughs> um, well, I think as far as what's most hopeful for me personally, um, and this does draw a little bit on the professional, but I will keep it mostly personal. Um, through work, we've seen a lot of data about Gen Z, um, and of course have been tremendously inspired today through all of our conversations with students. But what we're seeing from Gen Z is, I think, something really interesting. There is a greater interest in societal issues than we've seen in prior generations, even more than millennials, who I think already started to apply some pressure on some of those issues in the workplace or in other spaces where they'd not conventionally been talked about. Um, and something really interesting that we're seeing with regard to that is that... Um, our research experts are saying that Gen Z has what they call a gravitational pull. So not only are they raising these issues in the workplace, encouraging people to think about societal issues in a more extensive way, but in doing so, they're also pulling in other generations to join that conversation and think differently. So I think as far as the tremendous power and influence um, that youth have is in this moment, it's incredible. And I think definitely, based on the conversations that we've had today and um, you know, some of what we're learning from, from younger generations, I think that's really a reason to be hopeful. 
Yeah, and I, and I think we talked a lot about mentorship, and I, I think that that's so important. Um, you know, when I think about the work I do, both personally and professionally, when I think about social impact, philanthropy, where I sit on boards, uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day with my kids, everything we do, in my opinion, whether it's work, boards, or things that we've started, it's personal. Um, I'll tell a quick story about my personal passion to support women, and specifically women from underserved communities, but women in general, right? Young women and women of all different backgrounds. I think it was 2017, I had just finished my MBA at Northeastern, and I started feeling this heavy weight on my shoulder of, you know, what does giving back look like? How in the world have I gotten through grade school, learning the English language, gone through high school, undergrad, now grad school, and I say this with the most like humble place on skates as a girl. Nothing bad had happened to me. I had really met a lot of phenomenal women that have known that my mother wasn't here, that have corralled me. And so I went on to uh, Pontiac Avenue, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, shout out to Katie Fonseca, and I literally knocked on the door. Most people would have just gone to www.bigbrotherbigsister.com. And I walked in, and I said, hey, listen, I wanna be a big sister. And they looked at me and they're like, okay, she's crazy, but let's just sit her down. Um, and I remember a little girl who was 13 years old um, who was assigned to me. I think we, you know, I filled out all the application and they said, what do you want? What color? What, you know, I said, it doesn't matter. Just I want a girl that I can help because I just know that there's endangered girls out there. And she has changed me in a profound way. Fast forward, she's now 22, 23, going on to high school, uh, college. And when I think about there are thousands of girls, in 2017, I realized, okay, how do I, you know, we've all heard, be the change you wanna see in the world. So I think, Anna, you might remember when I sat down 17 of my best friends on um, February 27th, it was my father's birthday, 2018, and I asked my best friends, who are all full-time moms, careers, boards, and I said, listen guys, let's create a conversation for women who look like us. Let's make sure, look around. Is there a Nana? Is there a Lauren? Is there a Helena? What is our background? Let's create a conversation and let's change the tide of how things are done. Not that there weren't other women's conferences, they were. Um, and then I marched into the convention center in Rhode Island. I asked my husband if I can have my allowance for the entire year. I promised I wouldn't buy anything, I wouldn't eat out. And I put a down payment on a date. And we were committed. Um, you know, now it's six years later, and we have 1,400 women, and that's something I personally work on. There's no time for it. There are now 30 women invested in being mentors. We've given 30 girls scholarships that change. You know, it's as simple as a little girl does not have enough money to buy a bed and a bag for her dorm room, or books. Or, you know, we have a phenomenal institution like here that does a lot. We have volunteers from here as well. So that's a personal passion project that I think I'll continue to do is give back, give back to girls and women and our men allies. Thank you for that. And I've participated in your conference for many years. Um, and it is as motivating and inspiring as you hear Helena's words. So I have to say thank you for that personally. Um, just some final thoughts that you might have for our audience members while they get their questions ready for you. Um, I'll, I'll start with Lena. Sure, you know, I think it's hard to, to say anything finally because I don't, I don't want this to end even though it's been a good day. Um, you know, I, I would say we're, you know, as Lauren mentioned and as we've talked about it all day, I think we're at the, um, you know, at, at the intersection of I think what could be the greatest generation of our lifetime, at least my lifetime. I think this generation of Gen Z and millennials, and even I would dare to say Gen Xers, we are not afraid to say and talk. There's such an appetite and the, the momentum is palpable. The world is unhinged right now and there's a lot going on. So my advice is listen. Don't run from yourself. Don't run from adversity and lean in safely. Lean in, be respectful, but there is just a momentum of connectedness that I have never seen in my lifetime. And I'm encouraged as a mom of a 14-year-old boy and a 17-year-old boy who are both being handed a world from Gen, Gen Zs and millennials, I am encouraged. So don't run from yourself and don't run from issues. Lean in, get allies. Life is a campaign. I said that earlier. You're running a campaign, not literally, but life is a campaign and everything costs money. So focus on that. I think that's so powerful. And you know, some of the conversation today 
we got a couple questions that um, just really made me hold my breath. Someone saying, um, you know, is it even worth it? Sometimes I experience so much hate online um, for who I am. This was a queer student. I experienced so much hate online for who I am. Is it, is it even worth it for me to engage um, with others or, um, you know, try to build some of those bridges? And it is a really, it's a difficult question. Um, there's so much tumult happening right now. We're um, at the end of a couple weeks that have been so difficult globally with so much violence and, and tension um, escalating. And it, it is a, a very, very tough question. I, I will say that um, from an LGBT perspective, we know and we've seen through data that um, attitudes and lives are dramatically changed when people have relationships with someone who is LGBT, that knowing that person and having a relationship with that person dramatically increases acceptance. So I would say to, um, to young people that feel like they can to be brave and, and have courage and try to just continue building those relationships as, as much as they can and that you can enact societal change on a personal level just as much as all of the incredible ways that we're talking about right now systemically. Thank you. Thank you very much for imparting so much of yourself to our community here. We are grateful and for spending time today with our students and letting them know that, you know, you're kind of passing the baton along, but you're expecting them to reach for it and really give it everything that they have. So we appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I know we're, we had taken on some questions that we had intended to do. I can't see because I'm being blinded by these lights. So can't see I don't you, by know the way, which is where the, um, I'm sorry, that's my alarm telling me that it's time to take questions. There we go. Thank you. Um, we have a microphone over here and a microphone over here. So if anyone has questions that we could raise hands so we can take your questions. There's a question down here in the front. Uh, it's, not, it's not really a quite, well, I have a question and I also have more of a statement, I think. Um, uh, the, the statement was when you said at the very end um, that lives of students are impacted by uh, having contact with somebody else that's, you know, that's like them. So you said LGBTQ for somebody that's LGBTQ or that's queer. And I just wanted to say public to, publicly to everybody that um, I have always myself, uh, I'm actually gay myself, and I had a very a traumatic um, coming out, very traumatic. Uh, and so it's not something that I've offered to students. Uh, I keep it to myself. I don't hide it, but I don't, but I don't, I don't offer this to students. But um, since you just said that, I just wanted to offer to all of the honor students and any other students that you know that might want to benefit that I am here uh, as the honors director of the, pro of the honors program, and I'd be happy to help out uh, in any way that I can. Uh, so, uh, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for, for saying that public to, you don't need to applaud me, but. Um, my, my second question to uh, my second question to to you is um, I've heard a lot about uh, role role models um, women being role models for other women. Um, can you speak a little bit about role models? Um, you know, can men be role models to women? You know, can um, people? I mean, uh, how how do you? Does it have to be something that's like you that's that, that's a role model? And how can we go about mentoring? You know, sort of uh, across those uh, those divides, if you will. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question, um, primarily because I think that we have ecosystems of how we socialize and where we spend our time, what we consume, and we have a choice. But when it comes to role models, I really feel strongly about the fact that it doesn't necessarily be someone that looks just like you or, or of the same gender background. Um, some of my role models, you know, specifically looking back in retail and having raised myself in retail for 20 years and being really the only woman, forget the other layers that come with it, um, some of my greatest mentors were white men who are allies or white women who are allies. It's not a very diverse industry. Um, currently, you know, I think that my mentors uh, range from male, female, but starkly different from who I am because they provide a perspective that I don't know or they bring me in rooms that I would never go into. 
Um, so I would focus on that. You know, I think that there's also reciprocating that. Uh, when I think about, you know, at 46, not only do I have mentors and we have sponsors, but I also have this crazy humble moments where folks ask me to mentor them, and I think about what do they need versus what do I need. And so sometimes some of the things that they need is not necessarily what I could give them, but my job is to go find it. So I may call Lauren, we've had a great day today, and I've learned, and we don't, we, literally, I feel like I've known you, but it's that, you know, be open-minded when you meet someone. And um, when you're looking for a mentor, I think that you know jobs and schools and, and, and places assign you mentors. I really think it's a really organic chemistry. So don't be afraid about self-assigning or going up to someone and saying, listen, you're a beautiful human being. There's something about you I love and I wanna learn from that. And what does that look like? And those chemistries are pretty organic. So just be open-minded. They don't have to look like you at all, at all. I think that's absolutely true, and I also think there are so many things that men can do in a professional environment that help lift up women. If you're in a meeting, watch how often you're interrupting, um, uh, potentially speaking over a woman, or if you are saying something that um, is an extension of a woman's idea, make sure that you reference that back and say, actually, that's such a great concept, Helena. I, could we do one additional thing and add this onto it so that you're making sure to credit women in those spaces for their ideas? But um, certainly men play a tremendously important role in, in gender equity as well. Um, certainly men are at the table often making decisions about who should be promoted, how much individuals should be paid, et cetera. So, um, you know, really thinking about that decision making and thinking about potential bias and how that could affect that is, um, you know, a huge way that men can be an ally and really participate in the struggle for gender equity. Uh, yeah, hi. I, I was stricken by what you said about staying in the room. I thought that was really excellent advice. And I'm wondering if you had any experience of that that you could, could relate to us in, so that we kind of get that from the ground level. Yeah, I think I heard you say um, to, to kind of talk about staying in the room and not running or leaving the room when things yes. get difficult. I gave an example earlier, and you know, for those who heard me, I think it was 2016, um, I was an executive in retail. I was running a huge operation, you know, $805 million, and I had a phenomenal team and I called a meeting. It was a simple meeting, it was about reusable bags. I know it sounds super complicated, but it is. Um, reusable bags for all of the stores and what does sustainability look like, how are we gonna source, who are we giving the business to? And there was one person who has followed me throughout my 20 years in retail, who would give me levels of microaggression or pick on me, and he was in that meeting. Now, this is my meeting, um, and he kept saying, you know what? he kept repeating the phrase, let's make reusable bags great again. But he would say it in a way that, you know, if you remember what was going on at that time, that let's make a America great. So I was like, okay, he's gonna say it one more time. And I had an opportunity to either A, dismiss him from the room, because he started actually chuckling, other folks started picking up on him, my team, uh, my executive, my president and CEO was in the room. And I had an opportunity to tolerate, but also address him, but not in that forum. I had a mission to deliver. We had 451 stores. There was a crisis where we needed to deliver something that day, a decision. And this person showed up to hackle and to you know, create that unsafe psychological space of you know, how can this, and at the time, you know, I'm 46 now, at the time I think um, I was, I don't know, 29, 30, and he's looking at me like, how are you my boss? How are you telling me how we're gonna do this? So I'm just gonna pick on you. Um, stay in the room. Stay in the room, be respectful. Um, it's hard sometimes because you just wanna abort. Um, he could have taken me off my plan. You know, it's hard to stay in the room when someone is hackling you or saying things that are kind of covert and you know, super, super disrespectful. But I didn't leave um, to answer your question. I actually created this kind of, it's a muscle of tolerance, I always say, I never want to sexify resilience. I don't wake up trying to be the strongest person in the room. I give myself grace. Um, you know, I did Dale Carnegie uh, in 2015, and I really practiced the importance of living in daily compartments and living in moments and living in the moment and making sure that you're not completely undone. You know, you walk in a room, your mind is like a safe. 
there are many drawers. If you open every drawer, it's impossible to focus on every single issue. So I had to close some drawers, and at that moment, I took it away from me, and I said, this is about my team, this is about the greater good, and uh, stay in the room. Just stay focused and stay healthy and, and create your own psychological safety. We talked a lot about um, some of those difficult conversations in a business context and, and how those things arise. I was saying that, um, you know, at, at one point I was in a conversation with a business that was uh, talking about an LGBTQ issue and um, the CEO was talking about the position for their company and what that should look like and just said, frankly, I'm disgusted by LGBTQ people. Um, and, you know, in classes today, we talked a lot about that reaction and, you know, is it better for someone like me or from someone else from the community to be in that room or is it better not to be in that room? And those are difficult questions. I think that, um, I think that we are enriched as a society when we have a lot of different experiences and perspectives in the room. Um, and I think it's really critical. So, you know, another example is in the wake of, um, in the wake of the overturn of Roe v. Wade, or at least when the leaked decision happened, we had a number of companies reach out to us and say, we need to prepare for this. We don't know what this looks like. We know that this is gonna create a seismic shift for uh, you know, many women across the country with regard to health benefits and access to health care, and that people will be looking to us since the US is in you know, a, an employer-sponsored system of health care um, to help provide some of these answers and how should we handle this. And some of these were incredibly sensitive conversations. We were in a room one time with a very small group of executives, um, and one of the women executives in the room just started crying and said, it's really hard for me to hear you talking about this issue this way. I recently had an abortion. I was going through the fertility process as an older woman professional and have really struggled to have children and, and had an abortion through that process. And it was an incredibly difficult, um, emotional conversation. And so I think, you know, thinking about those rooms and, and helping those rooms be really reflective of the people that those decisions will impact is just a really important thing as much as people from the community can do it. And um, I know that it requires tremendous resilience. Um, I know that it, it is very difficult, um, but it can be so, so meaningful um, and create so much impact to have that happen. The question right here. So something that you talked a little bit about is um, a little bit here and a little bit during class was how um, like Gen Z and the younger generations tend to be a little more flexible in their mindsets and a little more progressive while the older generations are a little more not always, but a little more stuck in their ways. Do you think that the younger generations can go about changing the minds of both people in their generation and of the older generations to make more positive change? Young people are powerful. You're powerful. I hope that you recognize the tremendous amount of power that you have. Um, I will say from a business perspective, you are an incredibly sought after consumer. You influence other generations with regard to the way that you buy things and understand things and your view on societal issues as well creates a ton of impact and generates conversation. Um, that that to me, I think, is I hope one of the biggest takeaways from today is just how how much influence, um, that would certainly be how we would describe it in a business context, how much influence your generation has in setting the narrative for what should be important in, in business and society. And we know that Gen Z is the most diverse generation yet. We anticipate that trend will continue. We know, as I mentioned, that they continue to raise societal issues even more than millennials, um, and we believe that that trend will continue. So um, we certainly think, as you're, as you're referencing, that there is a tremendous opportunity for, for change.
I, I don't think I could just say, heck yeah. <laughs> but I do mean it. It's absolutely. And I think about, I think, changing minds and what changing minds mean. And Lauren and I talked about this all day. And, you know, changing minds and conversation is one piece. Changing mind and policy making, legislation, being in the room and, and, and making sure that as you look at, and we talked about, I think, you know, protesting. And protesting is like a continuum of generations upon generations who push the needle further and further and further. And when you see that that piece of the puzzle has the next piece that fits in, you might want to jump in there because it could be a lot of the same. Um, you know, I think that conversations are beautiful. You have to have this kind of emotional and social IQ that allows you to hold that space. But change is, you know, yes, conversation, because we could talk about it. But change happens in policy and making sure that you are in that room, you are holding office, you are penning a letter, you are, you know, making sure that the person that is saying no, you understand why. And most importantly, how powerful is their no? How powerful is their um, their power. And so then you cleanse that with some convincing, with some, you know, legislation and policy and campaigning in life. Um, but yeah, just I think conversation is one thing that I, I really say get in the room. With a final thank you to our panelists today, Lauren Gray, Helena Ajakaya, we are so grateful for the time that you have spent with us all day and for imparting your wisdom and your skills with us. If I can just have all of you applaud them and gratitude. Thank you all for being here this evening. We are grateful for your attendance and your attention and have a good evening. <laughs>